Uh, good evening once again, and uh, welcome to another Idea Hub discussion by Suffragic Stockbrokers. Uh, this discussion would primarily focus on uh, renewable energy. Uh, it's one of the sectors that has come into the limelight uh, as of late, and that is one thing we would definitely uh, want to discuss at this current juncture. Uh, so we have quite a distinguished panel uh, gathered here with us. Uh, we have Mr. Lasit Vimalasena, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Winforce uh, PLC. Uh, we have Mr. Roshan Pereira, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Fenton's Limited of Haley's Solar. Uh, we have Mr. Riaz Sangani, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Vidulanka PLC. And we also have with us uh, Mr. Mahinda Senrat, the Chief Operating Officer of Laughs Power PLC. Uh, so I think, uh, as you would see, just by that very, very simple introduction, this is quite a high-powered panel uh, with some of the leading uh, industry experts uh, from some of the top renewable energy companies uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, so along with that, let's uh, dive uh, straight, uh, straight in. So uh, I think over the past few months, uh, one thing uh, that has come out quite significantly uh, is the entire electricity crisis and the energy crisis in Sri Lanka. And the current numbers seem to suggest that uh, Sri Lanka still has a significant reliance on fossil fuels uh, to bridge the shortage uh, of, of renewables for the overall energy demand. Uh, but however, as we've seen uh, both in Sri Lanka and globally, uh, this is a trend that is changing and more and more there has been an increasing focus uh, on renewable uh, energy uh, in, in the world at large. Uh, so I think first up to set the context, it's important to understand uh, how the sector works. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, renewable energy, it comprises mainly of solar, hydro and wind energy, uh, especially in Sri Lanka. Uh, and, and there is an argument among the industry uh, that most of the key uh, high performing hydro locations uh, are currently, uh, uh, currently already being used and therefore it is alternatives like solar and wind energy uh, that may really uh, be the way forward. Uh, so in this context, it's uh, interesting to understand uh, uh, the, the mindset of some of these uh, industry experts as to how they believe uh, the way forward for this sector really looks like. Uh, so to begin with, I would like to direct a question to Mr. Lasit Pimlasena. Uh, so just to begin, uh, how uh, one thing we hear a lot is about the seasonality uh, in terms of uh, renewable energy, uh, whether it's solar, uh, whether it's hydro or even wind. Uh, so how does this seasonality and climate changes affect power generation in Sri Lanka? Thank you, Renal. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for this forum. Uh, well, uh, when you take the power generation statistics of Sri Lanka, 52% of the power generation in terms of energy, the annual uh, energy produced in Sri Lanka is from renewable sources, 52% out of uh, the entire uh, annual generation. So, but uh, out of 52%, 32, 30, uh, nearly 33% is coming from main hydros. Then we have around 210 mini hydropower plants, giving uh, totaling to about 420 megawatts of power, will give only 10% of the uh, annual power generation. Then comes to wind, including the 100 megawatt uh, wind power project uh, owned by CEB in MANA, the annual power contribution is around 4%. Uh, the private sector as well as CEB. And then uh, when it comes to solar power, ground-mounted solar and rooftop solar together provides around 1% of the energy requirement of Sri Lanka annually. So you can see uh, how, uh, I mean, uh, the, the reliance on uh, the hydropower, the main hydropower projects is more in Sri Lanka. So you will see, uh, you know, uh, the power plants, the hydropower plants are actually spread across the country, but still some of them are fed by the uh, southwest monsoon, whereas some of the power plants, uh, the catchment areas are located in uh, northeast, uh, fed by the areas fed by the northeast rainfall. So, however, uh, usually when you take the hydropower, uh, the rainfall, 
the southwest monsoon is the most, most predominant uh, monsoon gives more rain in sri lanka so therefore from january to april until april you will get a dry period in sri lanka and on the other hand wind power is also has the uh, effect of seasonality because uh, most of our wind power plants located actually uh, facing to the predominant wind direction of south west so therefore it is also the uh, mostly available during the period from may to september the wind season is from the month of may to september but uh, when you take solar power because all our ground mounted solar power plants and rooftop installations are spread across the country so th you won't see that much of a seasonality uh, with regard to the solar power but you can I, as i explained the contribution is just 1% so therefore definitely during the uh, period from january to april we each year we are facing a power deficit from hydro power Uh, and other renewable power plants because of that you can see actually either we go for emergency power uh, uh, resort or the power shedding this year so this is the uh, situation with regard to the seasonality of uh, effect of the uh, on the renewable energy uh, thank you mr lasit when uh, saying uh, so just to move on uh, to the next question which is uh, uh, along those lines so uh, i think right now also we have been experiencing some uh, high rainfall trends uh, that have been uh, that have come out uh, in in news so uh, how would this affect some of the generation stats and and would actually uh, what would be the quarter for the peak uh, generation of renewables i think you mentioned in terms of uh, the slow quarter being maybe january to march uh, but what would be maybe the peak quarter for for the renewables okay um, actually uh, the the flash rains you know uh, the, the the sudden rains of course doesn't uh, give much uh, benefit to the hydropower generation you know what what we have observed in the past was whenever the uh, the heavy rainfall is uh, seen the you can see the flash floods simultaneously you will have the uh, outages in the respective areas so sometimes actually uh, we will miss the uh, generation from mini hydro power plants to fed into the national grid uh, during very heavy rainfall so what is required for power generation to give a good quality power generation you need a gradual flow or you know a laminar flow of water during a period of time uh, from my experience actually during the past uh, uh, couple of years also i mean in during the past decade actually there has been some changes in the rainfall pattern so you can see uh, all of a sudden you will see a very heavy rain and then you get very long uh, dry periods so because of that i think uh, uh, now the mostly uh, most of some of the generation from expected from mini hydro power plants are uh, not been able to connect to the national grid uh, the, your question regard to the peak quarter actually in terms of hydro wind and solar i would say the the period from may to july is the best period for renewables hi uh, good afternoon apologies we had some uh, technical issues uh, on my side uh, as uh, ms lasitha vimla sena was answering uh, the question um, uh, mr uh, vimla sena i apologize I, i kind of lost you as you were saying that uh, you need more the stable kind of uh, 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 water uh, rainfalls as opposed to the the one off uh, rainfall that's right and uh, 
you, uh, question regard, with regard to the peak uh, for, the, for the renewables, I would say it is from uh, when it uh, comes to wind, hydro, and solar, all together in overall, from the period from uh, the month of May up to July, even if it extended up to August, is the best time period for the renewables. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vimalasena. Uh, so then uh, also just looking at uh, the fact that there is so much of uh, seasonality, uh, one question I would like to uh, direct to Mr. Roshan Pereira is, uh, is energy storage uh, a viable option for Sri Lanka? Uh, or is, is the market still too small or, or too new to be, for it to be financially uh, feasible? Yeah, so thank you, Rena. So in terms of storage, I think uh, the whole world is moving towards that and are adopting this. And it's uh, now more or less a proven technology. And it's, uh, I would uh, relate uh, the, the storage now to when uh, we first developed uh, major solar power projects in Sri Lanka back in 2010-11, right? So I believe it's time for us to also uh, go into uh, storage and start at least with some few large-scale projects. Uh, saying that, uh, again, due to the main power cuts, we are major power cuts we are facing in the market, we have seen a big uh, demand for battery storage systems uh, with solar power in the domestic sector also. And uh, this uh, in return uh, has created uh, an aware better awareness of the lithium battery technologies mainly that are available now, uh, which are much more durable and long-term, uh, unlike uh, the batteries that we are usually associated with. So it's uh, this, if I give you a brief idea about the lithium scale batteries, uh, they usually have a 6,000 plus life cycle, which more or less equates to about 15 plus lifetime. So there were major challenges uh, in the initial stages when it comes to the temperatures, uh, that, may, that there were a school of thoughts that uh, high temperatures of the tropical countries uh, degrade this lifetime a lot which was the case, but uh, now the manufacturers also have adapted and they are committing better uh, life cycles when, when it comes to higher temperatures also. So I, uh, even though it's still a little expensive, but I, uh, from the recent numbers, I don't think uh, with the, especially with the, when the uh, uh, fuel prices also rise to massive levels in the world, um, now I think it's time because I believe uh, the even the battery storage can be com quite competitive uh, with the peak power purchasing prices of the uh, country at the moment. So therefore, large scale. Uh, of course, we have already started in the small scales in houses, which in the longer run, in my personal view can be looked at because uh, one of the major issues this country is having is uh, peak demand between 6.30 and 10.30. So uh, this, even these uh, houses that are going for the uh, off-grid solutions may in the longer run when the power cuts are out of the way can convert to off-grid uh, during the peak time giving a bit of uh, you know uh, breathing space for the Ceylon electricity board and the grid uh, during that time. Right. So, and also hybrid solutions are also in place. So most of the people are looking at the hybrid solution. This is a combination of the on-grid and the hybrid. So I'm just talking about you uh, in the very small scale, right? And uh, this has only been introduced by the CB for the households only at the moment, which we hope at least they will extend it to the uh, factories and the industries moving forward. So in terms of storage uh, in the smaller scale, this is it. And also another thing that uh, we've been, uh, I think even electricity board has done a lot of research on and have the data is on the pump storage. So this uh, pump storage is where on, from a major hydro or somewhere when you uh, put the water down, you pump it back up when you have excess power or uh, another school of thought may be to use wind energy or solar energy especially floating solar plants to pump uh, this power uh, water back up which in return creates a very large scale battery uh, where it's comparatively low cost and uh, more durable so these kind of new technologies and innovative thinking is available and of course it's uh, for us to uh, start looking at these options 
in order to mitigate the you know uh, challenges we are faced with today especially sri lanka being an island nation so um, these kind of uh, technologies will really help us to stabilize the grid and the demand in the coming years uh, thank you mr roshan uh, uh, mr vimrasena uh, just another question back to you actually uh, this is also again with regard to uh, the battery uh, technology uh, i mean having uh, having different types of uh, uh, power sources uh, under uh, your company uh, if they are to adopt something like battery technology going forward uh, would you need uh, there to be a, a revision in tariffs or maybe a, a additional component in order to bear that cost or would that be uh, a more of a normal transition uh uh actually uh now uh, storage can be introduced to any of our uh, solar plants or wind power plants without any problem uh, the thing is uh, there will be a capital investment uh, for battery uh, installation uh, so actually there are several aspects of uh, battery storage uh, you can either uh, it is it could be used for several uh, uh, services of the grid require uh, required by the grid one is the shifting of the the you know uh, the you, you can actually do a scheduled uh, dispatch during the peak hours uh, you can charge the batteries during the day time or whenever the peak uh, the power is generated at the peak and then you can do a scheduled uh, dispatch at the time where the, the grid needed the power yeah. so that is one aspect on the other hand actually you can uh, achieve the smoothness in the uh, the uh, power curve of the solar power plant you know you you know that uh, the uh, the intermittency of uh, solar power generation is uh, very much because of the cloud cover and certain other aspects so you can have a smooth curve of dispatch by having a battery storage that's another uh, service of the battery storage and at the same time you can uh, have some stabilization of frequency you can actually give a support to the grid to have a uh, the more stabilized uh, frequency in the uh, grid so those are several aspects so uh, all around the world actually the battery storage are used for different purposes depending on the requirement so uh, for sure you are, so you are doing a new investment for the power battery storage you have to recover that with a certain reasonable return so either in terms of a, a capacity charge or depending on the the way you do the uh, grid services uh, cb can actually agree upon uh, a suitable tariff mechanism to recover the investment what we do but we are actually ready to do a uh, at any moment uh, as a pilot project even without any uh, see reasonable return we would like to do a, uh, a trial and see how well it is suited for sri lankan uh grid system but uh, hardly you get the uh, opportunity to do that thank you mr vimla sena so actually uh, that that also brought us into another uh, interesting question and that is uh, with regard to uh, tariff rates now uh, to what i understand usually the way contracts work with uh, most of the private players is that you sign for a period of 20 years with the government uh, a, a thing called a power purchase agreement Uh, and these come at at pre agreed rates with uh, jumps at different stages uh, which is how the uh, tariff rate is is decided for whatever a potential energy project uh, and after this these ppas might get renewed at different costs uh, but fundamentally that is how uh, uh, i believe that the industry mainly works uh, so if i may actually direct the questioning to mr mahinda senrat Uh, so, uh, what exactly is the method of selecting the tariff rate for a project, uh, and how is this uh, derived? Uh, Mr. Senarath. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you now, Mr. Senarath. Yeah. there is a, a signal drop uh, please excuse me for that one uh, i will go ahead uh, anyway uh, there are two methods uh, proposed by the government for the execution power purchase agreement first one is feed in tariff uh, that is for renewable energy project uh, of a scale less than 10 megawatt uh, 
uh, we heard that this proposal has been approved by the cabinet of ministers uh, but uh, it should be published it is not done yet therefore we can't quote the numbers publicly uh, other method is uh, is obtaining a tariff under competitive bidding process when such a procurement process is initiated by the ceb uh, this process is mainly focuses for the project larger than 10 megawatt that is applicable for both uh, renewable and thermal power plant. Those are the two methods available for obtaining uh, uh, tariff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Senrat. Uh, and also, uh, when it comes to uh, sometimes the breakup of the tariff, uh, you do find in some of the contracts a uh, fixed rate. Uh, and also a variable rate, which which includes uh, operation and maintenance costs or ONM costs. Uh, how how exactly does this uh, breakup work in a in a typical contract? Yeah, the proposed uh, first I will take the feed-in tariff. Uh, the proposed feed-in tariff for the renewable project consists of three components. First one is non-scalable rate that is accountable for the capital cost reimbursement. Second component is a scalable ONM rate. And the third component is a scalable fuel rate. This component comes into the picture when the project, uh, uh, such as biomass, dendropower uh, generation, which uh, use renewable fuels. So, uh, and for calculation, the calculation of the tariff, cash flow based formula uh, may use considering the parameters such as capital costs, inter, inter, interest rate, weighted average, cost of capital, ROE, inflation rate, exchange rate, etc. For further, uh, non-scalable rate uh, further break into three parts, tier one for the first eight years, tier two from uh, ninth year to 15th year, and tier three, uh, 16th year to 20th year. The non uh, the, this uh, non-scalable rate uh, uh, actually designed for introduce to have a positive cash flow during early operation period of the power plant where loans are service. To in order to have a positive cash flow, this time we uh, three tier system has introduced. Thank you, Mr. Anurad. And I think uh, one of the things you mentioned also was uh, uh, factors like uh, inflation coming in. Uh, but uh, from uh, what I understand also, it does take a period of time for uh, that inflation impact to be factored into uh, the tariff. Uh, would you be able to explain as to how long that uh, maybe time period might be uh, for that to be factored into the scalable costs? Yeah, inflation mainly will be considered for calculation, calculating the ONM component of the tariff. And also it affects the calculation of the project cost, uh, uh, especially local component. Uh, uh, normally tariff committee may consider three year average value of Colombo uh, consumer price in this CCP, CCPI along with the rupee depreciation or appreciation depending on the same period in calculating ONM component increase or decrease. The Colombo uh, consumer price index base inflation, uh, inflation rate is taken into consideration when calculating ONM increase uh, of ONM increase base uh, base value of the ONM component is calculated as a percentage of the capital cost. For example, 2% of the capital cost considered for the ONM for solar. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Senrath. Uh, and also, I think uh, this this probably just is a, is a question uh, uh, maybe to the panel or actually uh, if I could maybe redirect to uh, this question to Mr. Vimalasena once again, and that is, uh, I think, given the current conditions, uh, do you uh, see uh, for for the company or for the industry uh, some of the the maybe ONM costs being significantly higher than uh, what was initially budgeted due to inflation 
Uh, and if so, uh, would this have a maybe significant impact uh, for, for renewable energy uh, 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 margins? Uh, uh, and of course, yes, you know, uh, because most of the spare parts are imported uh, when it comes to hydropower and wind power, especially, I think, uh, or I would say 100% of the spare parts are imported. So the uh, exchange rate, you know, what we have considered uh, 10 years back in uh, way back in 2010, you know, we never expected uh, this kind of a uh, uh, variation. So uh, that is the major, the major hit, you know, uh, on the spare parts. The number two is, you know, as you know, uh, the, the, actually we have not hit by those aspects until now. I'm sure in the coming months it will, because uh, due to the inflation, uh, we will have to actually consider the uh, wage increase and uh, all the services have gone up. The, the prices of all the services, including fuel, has gone up. And, uh, you know, I don't need to explain you uh, what has not gone up, right? So definitely there will be an impact. Uh, it's huge because of this dollar uh, hit on spare parts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vimlasena. Uh, this next question, if I can pose to Mr. Riaz Sangani. Uh, so uh, with some of these increases coming in in terms of uh, spare parts and, and things like that, uh, would some of the private renewable players uh, look to uh, maybe maybe uh, want much higher tariffs at the bidding stage or how would uh, that work? Is this something the government has come to an understanding with right now? Uh, now, if, you, I, if you're talking about the existing project, like uh, uh, Sanrath explained, the, uh, there's a component in our tariff, the ONM component, which escalate, but like you say, it has a lag defect because speaking of moving average. So as a, as a renewable energy body, we have made representation to the CEB asking them to consider, consider this is a special year that's very to not to take the moving average, but only to consider this year inflation and give that adjustment in the next year ONM component. Now, how much they will take that seriously or accept it? It's very, uh, I cannot comment because those sort of decisions from a government body is very difficult to get by. They always stick to what is system and doesn't look at the practical or the commercial side. Uh, at new projects, like uh, Senra said, the new tariff has been worked out. There was a tariff committee appointed. What we hear, they have considered higher tariffs. Of course, it has to be, but still we are not, uh, we didn't get a chance as a developers to make any representation to the committee. The committee on its own decided the tariff. We have some idea what those tariffs are and there is a lot of discussion that tariff might not be adequate because in this tariff component, there's an interest component also. And today, if you go to do a project, you're looking at borrowing at 25% plus. So the tariff committee, unfortunately, has not taken in that into account. They have worked out the tariff on the basis that the interest will be around 15%. So it's a little bit uh, uh, totally outdated. Right? So, but anyway, we need to wait till once the final tariff announcement is done and see how the practicality of it, but I'm sure those tariffs are higher. So they have taken into consideration some, some level of increase in the o and cost. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sangani. That is definitely uh, something that's uh, encouraging to hear. But of course, as you mentioned, we would want to hear something more concrete on that uh, as, as we go forward. Uh, but I think that also gives us a good entry into, into the next segment, which is actually uh, in terms of some of the SOE reforms, or more specifically uh, in terms of the CEB. I think this is one thing that is uh, among the public uh, debate quite, uh, quite a lot at this particular point in time. Uh, so uh, with this regard, uh, uh, Ms. Roshan, uh, Perera, I think if, if you could probably just uh, look at uh, how some of these uh, reforms could potentially affect uh, the private players and, and would there be a benefit for uh, renewables as, as well? Very difficult question to answer. If I may put it uh, this way, it, uh, it depends on uh, who, who can decide ultimately once the reforms come. Uh, who decides on the energy mix of Sri Lanka? For example, if I take you back to, uh, to the history, even though there were certain milestones uh, of 80% renewables by 2030, which was subsequently changed to 70%, and uh, the political uh, vision 
uh, was never in line with uh, the uh, vision of the electricity board when it came to renewable energy uh, generation and the mix of Sri Lanka. So if we, if we can find a mechanism, a way where there is a national vision, national policy towards renewable energy, which will not change from government to government, and it is embraced and implemented in a positive way by the regulators as well as the uh, stakeholders. Uh, that is the uh, that sort of a mechanism will do wonders for the country. Um, because if you look at the issues we faced with uh, recently, a lot of criticism was uh, put into the CEB for their lack of enthusiasm in accepting renewables uh, as a reason for the power cuts and everything, which I would say part, partly true, partly not true. Because there, as, being, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as being an islander nation, uh, there are certain ways the grid is uh, developed um, to uh, absorb energy from various locations in the country. So, uh, but uh, like we discussed with, uh, with the uh, possibilities of adding storage mechanisms and as Lasit, uh, Lasit mentioned, uh, how we can uh, create better generation, uh, you know, uh, stability by introducing batteries and whatnot. Then, uh, of course, uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, look at integrating more renewables into the system where, okay, it's a capex outflow only, their running cost is very minimal. The fuel, uh, we don't have to keep on looking for dollars for importation of fuel or anything. We are utilizing our own energy that is freely available to us, right? And also another uh, school of thought is uh, in order to, uh, so these kind of uh, changes, if we can look at look at the whole generation as well as then of course uh, the other sector is the transmission the other sector is the distribution so these three sectors has to be looked at separately and uh, considered and uh, then of course uh, we can uh, we will be able to see in terms of distribution i think most of the overseas countries european countries have multiple players uh, uh, so we have the option of who I choose to buy my electricity from. There is no one monopoly. So those kind of things uh, will create that competitive advantage. And of course, then for each entity, there are separate uh, PNLs given where they are uh, driven to make profits and make their different entities profitable. So this kind of a mentality and a mindset will, of course, create a better purchasing and mechanisms as well as they will also look at uh, competitive and how to look at the least cost options when it comes to the generation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roshantara. So uh, I think uh, along with that, I think the one thing that has uh, really come to the public uh, has also been the uh, increase in terms of the electricity uh, uh, electricity costs from a, from a retail or consumer point of view. Uh, so uh, just another question, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Lasset uh, that is, uh, do you believe that uh, maybe some of these increases or at least some of these steps taken where they are very clearly indicating that it needs to be a cost-based approach, uh, does this maybe suggest that uh, there might be an improvement in some of the tariff rates uh, given to the private players or uh, would this purely mainly be maybe a cost cut, uh, cost cover measure for for the CEB? Okay, uh, <laughs> I would say not higher rates. Actually, in terms of numbers, it would be definitely higher uh, when you compare because because of these exchange rate differences and the inflation rates. In numbers, it will be more, but uh, in real uh, effect, I don't think that you won't get any increases. Uh, in the future also because but we are we can, we are confident that we can assure that uh, the renewables will be the cheapest at any moment so uh, no matter it is uh, at any uh, uh, level playing uh, platform renewables can uh, renewables can uh, be the most competitive uh, from all sources of energy so that's for sure so we can compete given the level playing platform to all of us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vimrasen. I think that's a, that's a very important uh, takeaway from this as well. Uh, the fact that uh, renewables going forward would be one of the most uh, competitive things. Uh, so another question uh, to, to look at for, from uh, Mr. Riaz Sangani. 
would uh, right now i think uh, one point that has come out uh, in this sector uh, which is a very critical aspect uh, is that there seems to be a backlog right now for in terms of receiving payments uh, from the state uh, and and uh, this also we believe that you know this could potentially uh, affect companies abilities to pay dividends if this actually does continue uh, now with renewables being viewed by investors as as a key dividend stock uh, how how do you see these developments uh, in the industry i think that's no brainer because if you don't get money obviously we can't distribute anything to the shareholder uh, of course some companies which are trading have a little bit of fortune that some companies have been there for a long time and have most of them paid their project loans i think valuable is one such uh, so those may still but still the our ability to pay dividends will become less because all the companies have now the payment cycle has gone up to 10 months so when there's so much of outstanding it affects the cash flow a lot and like i said some companies have paid their project loan but some have not and those who are not paid they get into a worse situation because their interest costs will go through the roof so not only dividends i think they will have a lot of profitability challenges so i think this is definitely a very serious concern and we as developers have been making a lot of lobbying about it but on the other side cb has been running at a tremendous loss so definitely when there is a loss making entity sadly the creditors are the ones who are going to get affected and among the creditors we are at the bottom of the list we are the unsecured creditors so the law priority goes for the secured creditors for the thermal payments for the and the government is also pushing to continue with the power generation so they need to keep paying the diesel generators so it's unfortunately we had a very bad because they are and we had to grind and grind but we keep lobbying to see if there's some uh, support they could get from the treasury and pay us some money and i think uh, the increase in tariff also consume increase in the consumer tariff will some i think should help to mitigate the cb losses so we are hoping that will also help to reduce our burden but at the moment the situation is very grave and also it's leading to a situation that i mean where like as it says we can provide power at a cheaper power so that means the, to have cheaper power in the future you need to have more renewable energy at the moment what we are supplying to cb the average cost to cb as per cb the cost is 17 rupees of course you take maybe more but still we are going to be much cheaper than diesel and i just leave one thought with you it's very easy to calculate the cost of diesel generation you just take the price of liter divide it by 4 today price of diesel is 440 for 440 divided by 4 it's cost only it's cost 110 rupees for 1 kilowatt hour so generating by diesel is going to be very costly so we need to get more renewable but sad side of it is when the renewable people are not paid they cannot invest and it's going to discourage any new investors so i hope the new government will take cognizance of this fact and do something give some treasury support at least to so that the developers could get paid and they could keep growing the industry which can be very beneficial to the people and for the people and for the country in the future uh, thank you mr sangani so i think uh, with with what you have shared and with some of the panelists before also have shared i think one thing that is coming out to me quite uh, visibly is the fact that uh, renewables is definitely uh, the way forward in terms of being the cheap alternative in terms of being the sustainable alternative uh, i think that is that is one thing that is uh, definitely coming forward and i think along with that uh, again when we're talking about this restructure of the ceb uh, they're also talking about uh, the process of approving some of the contracts that have been uh, pending for a long period of time uh now uh i i i i'm of the understanding that maybe some of these projects may have been bidded at maybe uh, uh at previous at at times prior to this and therefore given the current inflation or current cost increases uh and and for example even the the cost of imported parts like that was mentioned uh, with all of these things going up and also with interest rates becoming extremely high Uh, would that maybe discourage some of the players who have already uh, put in proposals, or would it discourage people from putting in further proposals, or would it actually more like be a, 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 a an intervention from the government side also to increase tariffs, and therefore would it encourage uh, growth of the industry? 
Okay. I presume you're referring the question to me. Yes, yes, I am. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So it's like this. Uh, one positive thing we must make a note of it. Again, not officially, but we get to know because we are in the industry, so we have a lot of access to all the grapevine. The last tender, which was for 150 megawatts, they have now decided, and uh, like you said, we tendered at the time when the costs were very much different. Today, we are in a total different regime. Uh, so what CB has decided is whatever tariff somebody bidded, his tariff will be escalated by the exchange rate, uh, the difference in the exchange rate between the two periods. So if he bidded when the tariff exchange rate is 190 and if today is 360, he will get the, uh, the total increase in the depreciation of the rupee. So that will, be, of course, a very positive move. So that will be good. Okay? But Unfortunately, while that covers your capital cost, it doesn't cover your interest cost. So I would think some uh, then people might still wait for a little while before they invest to see uh, till the interest rates come down. So and hopefully, if it comes down, then I think the more projects will start coming in. Yeah. Uh, I hope I answered your question fully. I didn't miss any part. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sangani. And actually, uh, this next question might be a bit of a a tricky question so i just open it up to anybody who would want to answer it and that is uh, given the higher finance costs uh, let's let's assume maybe a situation where uh, the companies are able to recover that backlog from some of the government payments uh, would you be saving up some of the cash flows for future projects or, or uh, would the focus be to to maybe uh, go with dividends uh, again, I know that's a slightly tough question. So if, if anybody wants to volunteer, uh, then go ahead. Well, for my side, I can talk on about my company. At this moment, it is tough for us. The cash flow is very tough. So for us to save money, there's, there has to be cash to save or give dividends. So there's no cash. But uh, one positive side for us is that we have a certain overseas income. But some of it again goes into uh, goes into meet the liquidity crisis. So it will be we will we will our procedure our strategy will be growing, and yes, at the moment also in the process of developing two solar projects. So we focus a lot on growth, but we want to give some dividends, and we are hoping if we get some money from CB, we will try to keep our normal practice of dividend policy, what we have, we would like to keep it applied. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sangani. Uh, Mr. Vimlasena, is there a question you might be able to answer as well? Yes. Um, uh, actually speaking, uh, Ryan, uh, now CB, uh, when, you take, uh, when you take CB, they have been very consistent in payment in the history. Only in one occasion, only in 2020, so I remember correctly, in uh, year 2020, we had a backlog of around six months. Uh, then they have actually uh, all of us. I mean, uh, they have managed to uh, cope up with that uh, soon after the COVID situation. But other than that, actually, CEB has been very consistent in their payments in the past. So we believe that with the coming reforms and uh, with the uh, revision of the customer consumer tariffs, CEB financial situation will be improved, and uh, they will come to a better manage, uh, you know, uh, entities and uh, they will be given the autonomy to be self-sustained in the future. Uh, what I heard from the news is that. So if that happens, uh, definitely there will be an opportunity in Sri Lanka for new projects. So we have to find money. That's uh, cash flow is uh, something else. But uh, for new projects, uh, we have, all our companies are looking for growth, uh, both locally and internationally. So uh, we have to find money uh, for the growth. Uh, that's not at all a problem, but um, Given the fact that uh, this increased interest rates, which are, uh, uh, you would say, uh, inflated uh, to uh, make the inflation sustainable, I don't think that uh, at this moment uh, it's the right time for a, an investment. But uh, either the government, if they need renewables faster, they have to come up with a scheme where the renewable energy developers be given a special scheme for their debt financing. Or otherwise, actually, we'll have to wait until uh, the thing stabilizes for the moment. I'm, and uh, But we have enough time, you know, given the project, you will need at least six months, nine months for preparations, right? For the approvals, you need 30-odd approvals. 
and uh, all of the uh, the preparations require time so they have to be you know uh, i mean if they act faster and given the project then we have sufficient time to make sure that the funding is available for the development in another one year also that's my view uh, thank you mr vimlasena uh, mr senrat is there any any uh, point you would like to mention there as well with regard to laughs i believe uh, mr senrat's connection might uh, be slightly uh, slow uh so we would uh, probably then just move on uh, i think we've covered some of uh, the key aspects of the local market and so i think in that light i think it will only be appropriate to look at some of the global trends as well and what we have seen is that in the past few decades uh, the technology for renewable energy has advanced rapidly uh, you are now being able to generate much higher outputs at a much lower cost uh, so if i may direct the question to mr roshan perera uh what have been some of the major advancements in technology uh and what are some of these technologies that can actually benefit uh, the local market or currently are we uh, up to date on everything yes <clears throat> so i will mainly uh, focus immediately on the solar power so when we talk of solar power uh, solar power uh, the solar panels have advanced a lot in technology uh where maybe not so long ago maybe 4 5 years ago we were working with 250 to 300 watt based solar panels now at as advanced to 500 even 600 watt panels are available for ground mounted systems and when it comes to the technology uh, in the sri lankan context uh, with these power cuts what we have brought to the industry is that uh, the capability to synchronize our solar systems uh, with the backup generator in the absence of a uh, in the absence of the grid or battery the solar systems of the are idly without generating any power when there is a power cut which uh, and in return as uh, rias mentioned the running of the diesel generators is very very expensive and when it comes to uh, industrial uh, grade generators it's uh, you have to divide by 3 so the cost is about 150 or 160 so because of that uh, we synchronize we have brought in the technologies to synchronize the solar systems for large scale systems so these are some of the in time uh, technologies that we have brought in and as uh, lasit mentioned of course the uh, by adding the batteries and now uh, uh, we can easily uh, you know uh, intermittency uh, frequency challenges most of the challenges that are associated with the renewable energy system when it is on its own has been mitigated so the, most of the challenges are mitigated while uh, by correctly sizing the battery as per the requirement uh, we can be very cost competitive also Uh, and uh, so depending on the requirement and the location and the, uh, uh, the requirement of the grid we can correctly size the batteries so that is where the key is in uh, in terms of uh, getting the pricing right and uh, understanding the requirement so and also <coughs> um, i think he can add more on the wind power uh, because he is the more expert on the wind so i would uh, stop in solar there <laughs> uh yeah then uh, yeah as uh, rashan said actually uh, the wind power uh, technology has also evolved a lot you know uh, during the last uh, last decade you know uh, initially in 2010 we have installed the biggest uh, turbine we have installed was 800 kilowatts whereas now uh, you get uh, the capacities over 5 megawatts that means 5200 uh, kilowatts so the size of the uh, turbines have increased uh, because of that actually uh, the the civil and other related cost has gone down so uh, the technology is uh, continually improving the day by day so uh, i don't uh, see any breakups uh, as uh, ran said there because uh, the in terms of technology uh, both in solar and uh, wind i think the technology has advanced in a very faster and a bigger way where actually the people have the access to the uh, very affordable prices uh, 
uh, right now because uh, uh, compared to the, those days uh, a decade ago, the uh, tariff was very high. We are now uh, because uh, to the uh, not because of any other thing, uh, because of the advancement of technology only, you can have this uh, tariff uh, structure uh, as you see today. Thank you, Mr. Vimlasena. And actually, I have one more question for you. Uh, and I think this is this is very uh, relevant to uh, reinforce as well. But uh, we have seen recently a trend of uh, local renewable players uh, expanding to to maybe the South Asian region and also the African region. Uh, was this mainly due to uh, uh, red tape uh, in in Sri Lanka, or and and therefore, if there are reforms, would you see investments coming back in? Or was this more a part of, you know, a broader diversification strategy uh, and other incentives in those countries as well? Uh, then, uh, actually, Sri Lankan companies were very active in African region uh, as well as in South Asian uh, region uh, for some time. I think uh, over, uh, say, during the last five years, they have been very active. Mostly, most of them are very active in hydropower sector in African countries like Uganda, uh, and uh, Rwanda and Malawi. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we are also there in Pakistan, uh, Uganda and uh, Ukraine. So uh, I think uh, more of a, uh, with a more of a view of uh, expanding their wings into the international markets is the main uh, focus of all the, these companies. And, uh, you know, the expertise gained in Sri Lanka by doing projects in hydropower, wind power and solar power uh, is the most, uh, you know, the promising uh, uh, benefit we have uh, within our uh, teams because when we go to uh, Africa, uh, our professionals are delivering the, the maximum uh, capabilities in uh, uh, developing those projects. So that's uh, the good sign. And uh, on the other hand, uh, as you said, perhaps, you know, uh, the delivering projects outside the country, uh, like uh, in the region, uh, the African region, and uh, especially in the African region, is very straightforward. And they are very consistent in payments. So therefore, I think anybody uh, who is having uh, uh, the capacity in the home grounds uh, will look at uh, the international markets. Uh, and you know, you, 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 you know that uh, during the last couple of years, the the opportunity in Sri Lanka, the home uh, grounds were very less, uh, only very few tenders were opened up, uh, the feed-in tariff was not available, and uh, we were more or less, you know, tied up uh, to a very uh, limited uh, cave. So I think that may, those are the reasons that uh, everybody is looking at international markets. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vimlasena. Uh, Mr. Riyaz Sangani, is there anything you want to comment down those lines as well? I want to comment about this SOE, the reform, uh, which I feel is low on it. So I'm happy to note that the government is looking at reforming SOEs and especially CB, and they have already appointed a committee and it looks quite, a, the composition looks quite good. We still do not know what the reforms are, but I hope the reforms will be in the right direction. And the, what we got to know is the reforms are going to be in line of what they earlier had published, but didn't happen. In 2002, they had a gazette about reforming the CB into three sectors, generation, transmission, and distribution. But only that sort of reform, I don't think will benefit because that will, well, it'll add value, but I don't think we'll see a very good tangible result. So I'm hoping is that uh, uh, the, they will look at more, creating more efficiency, maybe some more private sector involvement, creating a, uh, multi-buyer model because now we have only a single buyer because if you have a multi-buyer model i think like roshan said that might create competition and we saw that happening very well in the telecom sector uh, where the slt became much more efficient so i hope something like that will happen then the sector will be more efficient and that benefit will go on to the consumer and also it will stop draining the Treasury, because ultimately we end up when the treasury has to bail out, we end up as taxpayers paying for it. So I hope the reforms will look at very strongly how to make CEB more efficient. If I go to give you a specific example of how CEB inefficiency is, and I may mention this at many forums, we run mini hydro projects which are like two, three, four megawatts. 
CB runs those, and whereas when we run it at 20 million rupees a year, our operation cost, CB operation costs are 100, 150 million. So that shows how much of inefficiency is there. This is one example. There are so many areas where it's happening, and I think that's typical of any government organization because they have so many regulations and very little decision making power. So I think, like rightly, like our governor says, subsidy should be only for health and the education rest all should be on cost reflective and be more efficient. So I hope that sort of reform will happen. Then I will also add, uh, Renel, you asked me about this overseas. Yes, we invested not because we think Sri Lanka was bad, but we wanted to expand our horizon. And I don't think we can blame Sri Lanka because this is where we grew and we have built a base and that's the base which helped us to go overseas. So I'm happy I'm working in Africa, particularly in Uganda, and I'm looking at few other African countries like that. Many other developers have moved in. And I think unlike exporting our house made for labor, we are exporting here our engineering services. So which is a more dignified labor and bringing in income because some of, many of our Sri Lankan engineers with that get opportunities to work overseas and display their skill. So I think it's a good move and I hope many other companies will take that, uh, follow that path. So, uh, and, uh, and I think we have built a good base here. We have a good knowledge and we are capable to compete in the overseas market. So I hope more companies will follow that route. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sangani, for that uh, very detailed uh, explanation. And I think uh, along with this, I think as you were mentioning about some of the reforms, uh, another topic that has been in and out of discussion, I think for the last, I don't know how many years is, is uh, the whole discussion of potentially uh, a power share or power pipeline with uh, India as well. Uh, would you be able to comment on what kind of implication this might have, what maybe some of the benefits would be and how it might impact some of the private renewables players? Okay, uh, It's a bit technical question. Uh, from what I know is that we will get connected to a big grid system so the system stability will be better. Now one of the arguments put forward by CB is that they cannot create grid stability and we are a small uh, that's why they cannot absorb more renewable. So when they tell us that, we tell them is look at Europe. There are more than 50% renewables some countries are running and sometimes goes 100%. So their argument is, okay, that's connected to, to a big network. So maybe if you're also then connected to the Indian network, I think that might help. And there we have to also see uh, whether our off-peak times and their off-peak times are the same. If it's different, definitely I think it will help. But I think uh, maybe some of my other colleagues might be able to answer more on the technical side of it than me. Uh, thank you, Sangani. Uh, Mr. Roshan Perera, is that something you would like to uh, touch on? Yes. So this is, again, uh, something that has been in the discussion for decades, right? And it will definitely help Sri Lanka, in my opinion. Uh, in order to um, stabilize the grid as all, also to, uh, we can also sell when we have excess and like uh, Riaz mentioned, we have to look at the uh, demand uh, of the two locations, but I believe it can only complement uh, more us than India uh, by uh, getting this connected. And especially uh, if we are, uh, since we are planning to develop more and more renewables in that East uh, um, uh, Mana Belt, uh, it will be beneficial overall. Yeah, can I add a little bit? Uh... Yes, sure, please. please uh, actually, this is long waited requirement connecting to uh, connection uh, India actually beneficial, most beneficial to the Sri Lanka. We have a ample of uh, renewable and our peak and India peak is different. So we can feed during our peak time to the India that is a much larger uh, market uh, we cannot think of in Sri Lanka. So I think that is a, one of the uh, immediate action we should take uh, uh, as a country to enhance the uh, renewable sector uh, in, the, in, in Sri Lanka. And other things, uh, if we connect that one, actually it is another storage it will act as another storage uh, 
i think in that uh, point of view uh, connection this uh, india connection is very very uh, urgent action we should take uh, thank you so much uh, mr senrat uh, so before we move into the final uh, thoughts from each one of our panelists i would just like to take some questions that have popped up uh, in in our q and a uh, platform uh, and that is uh, one is there is a question that says uh, uh, there are delays by the cb in connecting to the main grid uh, why is this an issue uh, and also what are some of the new wind projects uh, coming up in the uh, north and the east uh, uh, mr riaz uh, is this something you would like to uh, answer uh there are delays in cb connection is what happens is uh, uh i think that's a, again what is the same situation of any many of the government organization there is a certain amount of bureaucracy and which leads to a delay i mean definitely they don't move as fast as the private sector and then they are decision making process so when it comes to most of the time the final grid connection maybe sometime they don't have the material so there are delays and some engineer there's a reluctant also has been there so even the proving takes longer than what it should they don't see the benefit of moving fast so that's my experience but uh, you mentioned something of the win maybe win plus it might be in a better position to comment on it i hope uh, this is uh, the adani uh, projects uh, they are referring to uh i believe so they haven't specified but uh, i think given the current uh, news that is circulating i believe that is a part of the question here uh, there has been a lot of discussions on uh, this uh, award uh, but uh, the thing is actually the, the mana belt was not open for local uh, investors for a long time i don't know for what reason it was not done uh, because all the wind blown across uh, the mana island Uh, during the last decade has uh, you know lost totally you know we would have make money out of that by that uh, for a long time uh, they were actually uh, not had the grid uh, on time in mana uh, but um, of course we what we believe is uh, the foreign investments direct investment should come to country in a crisis situation like this but uh, given the the uh, the competitive advantage to the local uh, investors is also a very uh, time requirement so uh, if it is on a transparent and it is if it is given on a uh, competitive tariff uh, i don't see any uh, problem in uh, this particular uh, award but uh, you have to the, the government has to be very transparent and uh, has to give the equal opportunity to the local investors who are waiting decades to get a 10 megawatt power project thank you mr mr sena uh, so i think uh, there is also another question again this is also with regard to connection uh, i think i could probably direct this to uh, mr roshan perera and that is uh, does the cb have sufficient power stations to connect its uh, new supplies to the main grid or would there have to be maybe more investments for that yeah so uh, okay the uh, so mainly uh, that's what i uh, see when especially when it comes to large scale or any rooftop project right now uh, they look at the uh, grid availability and the substation availability and also uh, when it comes to tender large scale projects they look at it and identify it and only put it to tenders right but when it comes to rooftops uh, they always uh, we have to obtain what we call as a grid clearance uh, from the electricity board and they give a approval for that and uh, and when sometimes we have seen some uh, 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 applications being rejected and uh, of course sometimes uh, the application uh, when we request for say 500 kilowatts of a solar system maybe only 50% or uh, something is only approved uh, citing uh, grid limitations uh, so mainly so there are certain um, limitations of the grid of course which we have to understand and uh, with the transformer capacities and the demand and everything but uh, in my personal view most of the grid strengthening is not as expensive as it may show and also when it uh, these are with related to the uh, small distribution scale 
And of course, when it comes to the large scale projects of uh, wind or solar, uh, the developer is supposed to do the transmission line also and all the way up to the grid substation uh, that the uh, uh, system is supposed to be connected to. And that is part of the investor's uh, cost uh, of the development. So with that, I think, and also I know historically and uh, ADB has funded a lot of grid strengthening projects for CEB uh, for the grid strengthening purposes and after. And by strengthening the grid and changing again, if they have a clear vision of where they want to absorb more power from and identify it, which they already have, I believe most of this information, then they can have a very concrete plan of what they want to strengthen, what more additions they need. And also they can, uh, of course, what the technologies we discussed helps lessen that cost, like battery storage and whatnot, lessen that uh, additional cost of uh, having to um, upgrade the grid a lot more also. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roshan. Also, just one more question to you uh, before we conclude, and that is, uh, there's also a question which I think got raised before also, uh, with regard to spare parts, uh, typically how often uh, would you would you have to uh, maybe, uh, uh, would the need arise for spare parts for, whether for, for say, solar uh, versus wind versus hydro? Uh, or is it purely on like a situational where you might keep a couple of backups and if there's a breakage, you replace? Yeah, so I would uh, rather split it into three. So I'll discuss solar while Lasit can discuss sure. wind and maybe uh, Riaz can discuss uh, or even Mahindra can discuss uh, solar also. So in, when it comes to solar earlier, it was only centralized inverters of a megawatt scale or not, uh, which was the, uh, but now the technologies have evolved and the, we are going with mostly up to 100 kilowatt scale inverters. So it's split into many inverters. And, uh, and also when it comes to solar panels, it is also much scalable. So 500 watt panels and multiples. And when it comes to solar, there's hardly any maintenance other than the washing. And also in, in terms of inverters, when it comes to string inverters, it's either a board replacement or one-to-one -one replacement, which is easier because the downtime uh, of the system is much less when you have 100 inverters as opposed to 10 inverters when there's a one uh, breakdown. The redundancy is better. So be, uh, with that, uh, we, uh, in terms of solar, uh, we keep on spares, but the maintenance is less. But when you have tracking technologies and all that also, we need to keep maintain certain amount of spares. But out of the three, I would say maintenance cost-wise, solar is the least uh, maintenance cost. If anybody else would like to add anything to that. Yes, uh, so is it? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to wind power, you know, uh, in Sri Lanka, most of the wind power plants are located near shore, almost, uh, you know, uh, along the shore. So because of that, actually, uh, now the wind power turbines are having a lot of power electronic related equipment. So therefore, the continuous uh, maintenance are required in terms of wind turbines. So you have to keep uh, the power electronics, inverters, and uh, sometimes even the generators, which are having permanent magnets, where you can see some failures due to the corrosion of permanent magnets, also visible in some of the turbines. So therefore, the continuous supply of spare parts is required in terms of wind power uh, operation and maintenance. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lasset. Uh, Ms. Reyes, would you like to maybe cover uh, uh, hydro? Uh -huh. is that yeah. Some in hydro cases, uh, I think we are in between the wind and the solar. So wind requires a lot of spare, solar little, I think we are in between. In our case, uh, the requirement of spares, again, are not very much. Maybe there may be some bearing going out, the runners get worn out, but there can be some amount of uh, adjustment, rectification could be done. Uh, so repair the requirement of spares maybe on the electronic side and all we need to keep, but it's not very as much as uh, what is required for a wind power project. I don't know whether Senrath has a different view. Uh, Mr. Senrath, uh, anything you would like to add on that? No, Mr. Riyas already mentioned all the things. Uh, I think I am agreeable to the uh, Riyas uh, opinion. Um, thank you, Mr. Senrath. Uh, Mr. Senrath, just one final question to you before we uh, go over to the final comments, and that is, 
there's a question regarding uh, you would like to know whether there are any USD linked uh, tariffs in uh, Sri Lanka and if at all whether this can be something used to develop projects given the crisis. Uh, anything you can uh, say in this regard? Yeah, there are there are some uh, power purchase agreement that is uh, actively pegged to the USD, and that is eighty percent of the eighty uh, percent uh, of variation pegged to the USD change. But uh, there are the for the for the renewable power projects uh, so far there is no any USD based uh, power purchase agreement, but. Uh, uh, the USD PIC uh, power purchase agreement are there. If there is a higher uh, substantial change in the exchange rate, then we can adjust the power purchase uh, tariff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sanrath. Uh, so with that, uh, I would just like to go into the closing remarks from each one of our panelists. And uh, Mr. Sanrath, if we can begin with you itself. And that is uh, overall, given most of these volatilities and uh, some of the opportunities uh, in the long run, uh, what is your uh, what is your view in terms of the Sri Lankan renewable energy sector in the short, maybe medium and long term? Actually, uh, since uh, our government has focused on uh, seventy percent target, actually in the coming future in the long term and the uh, medium term, we have very good uh, future for the renewable power. Uh, for example, uh, by 2030, uh, we have to add around another six gigawatt of uh, capacity. So we have a very good uh, uh, future for the renewable power sector. But at the moment, present crisis situation will hamper the development of the sector because of the our operating environment has already changed in the change and it is not financially viable at the moment. But I think uh, coming days, the, the renewable power sector may get the very good uh, opportunities and uh, will advance. At uh, the same you, time, I, I, I want to highlight uh, CB, our utility, should uh, encourage uh, newer technologies such as uh, battery storage uh, uh, in the utility scale, uh, green hydrogen. Those technologies we should absorb as early as possible in order to uh, make the best, uh, uh, best return in the future. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Senrath, for those comments. Uh, if I may move on right now to Mr. Roshan Perra, I think with regard to uh, potentially even the entire rooftop solar segment, uh, what would you believe is maybe the short and then medium to long term outlook for that segment? Yeah, so I would like to first uh, thank SoftLogic and you all for organizing this and inviting us for this knowledge sharing session. And uh, I believe Sri Lanka's uh, renewable energy potential is massive huge and uh, with the uh, connection of Indian grid BB can very well be a seller more than a buyer in that line uh, uh, to the grid by integrating that and absorbing much renewables and most of the renewables 99% uh, of the time it's a capex uh, only so running cost is very low therefore it's a one-off capex dollar outflow only so we don't have to continuously keep looking for dollars and uh, trying to source because the fuel is the nature. So the, the, more, the faster we understand this and uh, take more and more renewables and look at renewables in a positive way, uh, the better the country would be as a whole. And of not to mention the greenhouse and the you know uh, uh, CO2 footprint reduction and all. So we are blessed with plenty of wind, plenty of solar power, and uh, plenty of rooftops also. So we don't have to really cut down the trees to put solar massive plants. We have plenty of rooftops, uh, which are untapped still. So with all these uh, uh, technologies coming in, uh, we can uh, definitely be a seller uh, of renewable energy in this country. That should be the vision. Thank you. 
thank you so much, uh, Mr. Roshan Pereira, for those thoughts. Uh, if I might move on to uh, Mr. Riaz Sangani, so I think uh, with regard to uh, the, the industry and, and some of the policy changes also that is uh, currently coming in place, uh, where do you feel uh, in, in the short run and then subsequently the medium to long term, uh, we would see uh, the, the renewable energy uh, uh, industry going? I think you've also mentioned in terms of the cash constraints so with, with all of these things factored in, how do you see uh, the progress? Okay. Well, I will take it that recent increase in the tariff was something of a good move. I know we are all suffering for it, but at least I feel that's an eye opener because all this time with the electricity subsidized, nobody sees a need for change. And we need a change, change from the from thermal to renewable because long run it is cheaper. We are not dependent on foreign exchange except at the initial stages, like Toshen said. So we will create energy security. So I feel it was a right move. And with that, I think there are policymakers. I think maybe even the reform of CB will have come, maybe a reason. So I think now people are all realizing it that there's a reform necessary. And I hope the reform will be in the right direction. And any reform will have to take into consideration the benefits of renewable. So when those reforms take place, I'm sure the renewable will have a place. And also, I think they'd be eye open. I think from a CBS point of view, our experience has been a lot of the people at the CBI are anti-private sector. They think we are all there only to make money. But actually, we are doing a much better, bigger, important role. We are actually creating sustainability and we are creating energy security in the country. But they don't want to see that. But with this kind of a... The uh, pressure on people with the consumer tariff, pressure from people with the consumer tariff going up, I think they are going to open their eyes. Even with the power cuts, I think the public opinion is getting against the CB. And that I think will create, will be good because the, that the policy will change. People will look at in the right direction and that is the way forward is renewable. So I think a lot of uh, if, uh, focus will be there. So I think the sector will continue in the right, they will benefit in the medium and the long term. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Riyaz Sangani. Uh, and I can see uh, there are quite a few questions coming in, but in interests of time, I think we would like to close this session with the final words from uh, Mr. Lasit Vimlasena as well. Uh, uh, Mr. Vimlasena, uh, again, as, a, as one of the largest renewable companies, uh, what is your view in terms of uh, renewables in Sri Lanka? Uh, in the short run and then subsequently in the medium to long term? Uh, as uh, very correctly said uh, by Roshan and Riaz, I think uh, in the long term and in the long run, uh, renewables will be the only hope for Sri Lanka. You know, the country blessed with uh, sunshine throughout the year, uh, country blessed with uh, uh, lamina flow of uh, wind power across the country, where, you know, the uh, of course, the hydropower and uh, I can't see any, you know, uh, any reason preventing uh, renewables coming in to play the major role in the power sector in the future, uh, in medium term and long term. So short term terms, of course, CB has to look into because they have not taken the correct decisions on time. So they have to look after the short term, but medium term and future, given the opportunity to Sri Lanka local uh, developers uh, or otherwise the international developers, I'm sure that we can tackle the situation and give the proper you know, mix of energy to the, uh, the national grid to uh, make the country uh, uh, a lucrative place. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Vimalasena, for those thoughts. And in closing, I would like to thank all the panelists for joining us today. Uh, right now, the country is going through quite a tough period and uh, energy is an is a essential service that we are most grateful for uh, now, if not more than ever. Uh, so thank you for your contributions also to the country. And we hope that uh, your companies also would be able to uh, uh, really grow and develop over the coming years. Uh, we do hope that most of the reforms do end up being positive. Uh, and we look to follow you, uh, the sector and also your companies quite closely. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank everybody on behalf of SoftLogic. And with that, this webinar would come to a close. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in, and good evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.